All right, praise the Lord. Okay, brothers, I thank you for being on this evening. I know this is not a scheduled uh, meeting that we would normally hold on a Thursday evening at seven o'clock, but there are things that are happening around us that <clears throat> it's important. It's just important that I talk with you. And, and this is being recorded and hopefully anybody that really could not be on tonight I heard from one person that told me that they could not be on tonight. And I said, don't worry, I will make sure that it's recorded. So uh, this is being recorded now. What I'm gonna do is share my screen to make this easier to cover what we need to cover. So um, I'm gonna open this up. Can everyone see this? Can everyone see my Bible software? I see it. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. All right. So what I want to do is, first of all, I just need to open up in a word of prayer. And the plan is to just walk through my notes because it'd be super easy for me to get off my notes and not cover, and not cover everything that I really believe we need to talk about. And so uh, hold any of your questions and comments and that until I'm done. And then we can talk. Uh, let me just open us up right now. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for the men of this fellowship, of this household of faith. And I pray, Father God, that uh, for all of the brothers that could not be on, I pray that what I cover here tonight will be brought forward in a way that is clear. And I'm asking you, Father God, to anoint what is happening. I ask you to anoint my words, to anoint the things that uh, that are going to be said, and to bless every brother where they are with the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you, that our eyes can be enlightened to see what is the hope of the calling you placed on each one of us. So I ask, Father God, that uh, throughout the course of this day, if, if my brothers didn't have a chance to really talk to you and and repent about anything, I cover that now. In Jesus' name, I ask you to forgive us of any sin, any transgression, any wickedness, any darkness, anything that will keep us from hearing what you are saying to us in this hour, what you're speaking through me. So I thank you for that, Father God, and I pray that the result of this time together is encouraging, um, that it's also provocative to move us towards the good works you have created us for. You have created us for specific works and put us in this time so that whatever things you have spoken in the past about this day, we find our place in it and we are productive and we are not coming behind in anything. So I thank you for this, Father God, as we move forward, that the ultimate end of it all is that you are glorified and that my brothers are stronger in the Lord for this meeting in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so brothers, I made a glory. what I'm going to talk about here tonight, um, I'm going to be going through scriptures, so I'm glad you're able to see my, uh, my software, to see the Bible on one side and see my notes on the other side. And um, when I was sending out the notes, when I was sending out the text message, and I addressed you all as stewards of the end times, because that is where we find ourselves. We are, we are not just to be considered, which I don't think any of us really looked at ourselves as just church goers. So we're not just considered church goers. And I believe that we see ourselves as being sons of God, being men of God. And we might be looking at what it means to be a man of God to varying degrees. But tonight, I want us to, to look at where we are, look at what the scriptures are saying. And also, um, I want you to be able to process some of the things that I'm going to be sharing that come from other men and women of God in the body of Christ, because we're just at a different place in time. And it's important for us to understand it, to know it. 
There's so much that I want to talk about, and I do not have the time to do that. But hopefully, if I just stay with my notes, I can read through everything, because I'm planning to read through all of my notes and to cover the passages that I've got highlighted, so that at the end, um, you have a more comprehensive picture of what I understand. I want to be able to download everything that I've got. I do. I want to be able to download everything that I've got. I want to be able to put it into all of you. I'm looking that there will be younger men that come in with greater energy and, and, and catch on fire and that they can run faster than we do, but they may not be as wise, but we're there to give them wisdom. But I'm looking to be able to uh, share everything that I've got with, with all of you. And tonight is just, just a fraction of the things that I want to talk about. So I'm uh, going on to my notes so that you all can see it. Uh, I'm calling this time um, and, and, and this message that I want to share. And it's important that we understand this is a message. And from this point forward, going forward forever, what we need to be about is messaging, is messages. And I don't think we've ever been a group that's been kind of using the language of sermons, but it's been about messages. And more than ever, it's important for us to understand that we are responsible for a message that's coming from heaven. We're responsible uh, to take this message and first of all, make sure that our families understand the day that we're in. Our, our wives, our children, everybody needs to understand the day that we're in and that we are messengers that carrying something important from God. As I've got here highlighted in, in Haggai, I'm gonna to go to Haggai. In Haggai chapter uh, one, verse 13, it says, then spake Haggai, the Lord's messenger, the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. That's the first thing everybody needs to know. That no matter what these messages are, Everybody needs to know that God is saying, I am with you. Amen. Okay. So I am with you. And the Lord, and the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shipiel, the governor of, of Judah, and the spirit of Josiah, the son of Joachedek, the high priest, and the spirit of the remnant of the people. And they came and did the work in the house of the Lord of hosts their God in the four and 20th day of the sixth month and in the second year of Darius the king. The point is, this message came to stir everybody up. And they were going to do the work of, uh, uh, of the house of the Lord. And we are called as uh, New Testament people to bear the tabernacle or be the house of the Lord and to work on this house and to build this house and to strengthen this house. But we need to be stirred in this moment to move forward. So it's a very clear thing that God has been saying to me that everyone needs to see themselves as a steward and a messenger. Stewards have to carry their responsibilities with a certain amount of gravity. And the scriptures tell us that we are called to be stewards. As the scripture says, so let a man account of us as ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. That's what we do. We, you know, Paul is writing this and he wants us all to understand that as he's teaching, he says, follow me as I follow Christ. And if you're going to follow me as I follow Christ, you're going to be carrying responsibilities as stewards of mysteries that I am going to be sharing with you. Because he uses this word mystery like 27 times in the New Testament. It's a very important word. But the key thing that I want to lean on is the steward. So we're called to be messengers. We're called to be uh, stewards of the message of this last day. Now, let's just take a walk through scripture here and understand this one thing I want to say as well. That uh, I'm just going to bring it up and maybe you can see it. The Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you can see what I've got highlighted here in the note page. Can you all see the scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 11? Or is my cursor in the way. Can you all see it? Well, I just went. Yeah, we can see it. Uh, well, I just went to it. It's uh, 
First Corinthians 10, 11, it says this. Now, all these things happened unto them. It's talking about Moses. It's talking about what happened when they came out of Egypt. It's talking about how they murmured and complained, of which I need to say right here, right now, going forward, nobody is to complain or murmur about anything because God is going to be getting on your case about that. We need to be people that can speak the words of truth. When it's time to speak the truth, we speak the truth. But we can't be people that are complaining and murmuring anymore ever again. We just cannot do that. And we need to be settled on the fact that we are, we've are we been called together. We are in this ministry together. And one of the things that God has done, true to his word, is he gave us this place that we're in. We have a property that should have cost us a lot more money with a lot less land and, and probably should have lost it during the height of the pandemic. None of that happened. You know why? Praise God. God gave it to us. And anybody that doesn't see that is not thinking straight. <laughs> they don't, they're not seeing with the eye of faith or understanding with the mind of the Lord what this is. And I need to make it clear, this is something that God has given us to help build the body. It's a, it's a center to help develop believers into becoming disciples not just believing what the scriptures say, but actually following after the Lord in everything and totally sold out so that as we do this, people are able to carry a message that they have received here back to their spheres of influence, back to their families, back to their friends, back to their coworkers, back to their neighborhoods, and begin looking at the possibility of building up some kind of work in your neighborhood, out of your house, because we're coming into a time where the church has to be disaster proof. So understand that these things that we're about to read, all these things that were written in the Old Testament, it says, now all these things happen unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. We are stepping into our time. So everything that we're looking at in the Old Testament now is going to have greater relevance with, with revelation opening on how those things that were written back then are to be appropriated by us in a New Testament with a New Testament understanding being guided by the mind of the Lord. And so we're going to kind of skip over some things here. Is everybody with me so far? Amen. Still here? Amen. Amen. Uh, I want to double check something here. Let's see. Okay. So, <clears throat> reading that last scripture, no more murmuring, no more complaining. Don't do that. Don't, don't do that. If you've got an issue with anybody, you just go to them or you pray and just let it go. Because we can't do that anymore. That that stuff, you, do you know that murmuring and complaining caused the children of Israel to all die? They all died out there because they were doing that. And we do it in the New Testament feeling like there's no repercussions. Oh, we're in the day of repercussions now. So I'm telling you, stop. Don't do it. Okay, so we're, we're to learn that. So what's the, what's the first things? And what we have to do is to build towards each other, strengthening each other, encouraging each other. And if there's a rebuke, okay, bring the rebuke, bring the rebuke, and then build behind the rebuke. Let the truth be said, and then build. I'm not telling people to, to lie or to hide what the truth is. I'm telling you to be men. To speak the truth, speak. If you got an issue with anybody, go to that person like a man and deal with it. Don't ever start complaining behind their back like a girl. Don't do that. Okay, so we leave that kind of stuff to gossipers, and men are called to do that. Now, uh, 
I want to take a walk through the scriptures and I want you to contemplate what do holy men do in a appointed time? What do holy men do? And as I said, I can't cover it all, but here's the start. So I want to start here by looking at a few things. I want us to remember the timing that we're in. I've been talking about this for a long time. Matthew chapter 24, verse 8 says, these are the beginning of sorrows. When we hit 2020, that was the beginning of something. It was the beginning of sorrows. Mark, uh, uh, before I even go to Mark, there's something that the Lord said do. First, he says these are the beginning of sorrows in chapter 24, verse 8. But when we get down to chapter 24, verse 42 to 44, he says this. Watch, therefore, watch, therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord comes. That's verse 42. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, be ye also ready, for in such an hour you think not, the Son of Man cometh. So he says, watch. He gave a lot of detail about what was going to be happening in the last days. And then he concludes by saying, watch right here. And then he says, if they would have watched, they should have known. But then he says, um, for, therefore also be ready. For such an hour, the Son of Man cometh in an hour that you think not. When we go over here to Mark, Mark says, learn the parable of the fig tree. For when a branch is yet tender and putteth forth the leaves, you know that summer is near. He's saying, as you can discern, just looking out at nature, you should be able to discern the time that you're in. So ye, in like manner, when you shall see these things come to pass, and if you're wondering what things, go back. Look at Mark 13, the whole chapter. Look at Matthew 24, the whole chapter. Don't have time to break it all down now. But by the time we get to those things that Jesus pointed out, he's saying these things. To recognize the day that you're looking at, um, discern the time. And then he says in verse 20, 29, so ye in like manner, when you see these things come to pass, know that it is nigh, even at the doors, even at the doors, Verily I say to you, this generation shall not pass away till all these things be done. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So this is what the Lord is saying here in, in um, Mark. And he says, but of that hour and of that, uh, but of that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels, which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. Take heed, and what does he tell him to do here? Watch and pray. Watch and pray. All of this hard stuff happening, and he's saying, okay, this is what I'm going to tell you to do. Watch and pray. For you know not when the time is. When the Son of Man, uh, for the, uh, 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 okay, let me just stop right there. Take heed, watch and pray, for you know not when the time is. And in Luke when I come to Luke, looking at the ninth verse, when you shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. He says, for these things must first come to pass, but the end is not yet, uh, is not by and by. The end is not yet is in Matthew, but the end is not yet Matthew, but here it's the end is not by and by. And then he says, nation shall rise against nation. Literally, that's ethnicity against ethnicity. It can be everything from a whole nation to an ethnic group. Think about it. Uh, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, famines and pestilence, and fearful sights and great signs shall there be from heaven. So I'd love to break down each one of these, but let's just stop here at what he says there. And then I want to come into verses 19, when it says, all these things are going to happen, he says, in your patience, possess ye your souls. In your patience. One of the key things the Lord has been saying to me is understand the requirement of patience and perseverance. Get that deep down into our, our spirit. And he says, and when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, 
then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. So it's right now surrounded with armies. But I want you to remember that I did cover a while back that until 1949, before 1949, Israel did not exist from 70 AD up to 14, up to 1948. Israel didn't exist. That's 1,878 years. It didn't exist. Then in 1948, Israel comes back into existence. 1967, they capture part of Jerusalem. 1973, there's a six day war that should have destroyed Israel and miraculously they won it. And then in 2017, Jerusalem is reestablished as the capital of Israel. We are in a different time now. So the scriptures tell us, but of, of all things, well, let's just not come back here. It says here in verse 14, wherefore he said, awake thou that sleepeth and arise from the dead and Christ shall give thee light. There's a big difference between what the world is trying to push as wokeism versus the Holy Spirit saying, you need to be awake. These are different. And it says, Christ shall give you light. See then that you walk circumspectly. That means looking all around, checking things that are happening around you. Walk circumspectly, not as fools. There are plenty of people that say that they are Christians. And they are walking as fools. And you men cannot be among them. Not now. You cannot do it. So we're called to be wise. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because these days are evil. Paul wrote this anticipating the end is coming. But now it looks like it's really, really here. So we need to understand that now more than ever, these things that are written are written for us, and the days are evil. Verse 17, therefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And that's what we need to do is understand what is the will of the Lord. So now I want to show you something. The Lord had me reading through um, the Kings, looking at a particular situation with Josiah, and Josiah was a king uh, born of Manasseh, his father, who was a very wicked king who in the last days of his life tried to pull things together. But then Josiah comes along. And all I want to do is read kind of what's in the yellow because I don't want to take a lot more time. But it says, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. And he did that was, was right in the sight of the Lord and walked in all the way of David, his father, and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. So he's a good king. He's a righteous king. Verse 4, go up to Hokia, the high priest, that he may sum the silver which is brought unto the house of the Lord. So Hokia is going up and then find something. It says, Hokia the high priest said unto Satan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hokia gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. This is significant because God had given a commandment to the children of Israel that when you get a king, you better make sure that he meditates in the law day and night. It got uh -huh. so bad in Israel, they lost the book of the law. So there was nothing to meditate on day and night because they lost it. And then it's found many years later by Hokia. And Hokia talks to the scribe. And, and the scribe presents this to the king ultimately. And when the king sees it, oh, man. It came to pass when the king, I, I should have highlighted this. It came to pass when the king had heard the words, the book of the law, he ripped his clothes. He immediately went into repentance. And he says, what, what have we been doing? So he's repenting. And, and he needs to find out, what else do we need to understand about this book? 
So the scripture says, concerning the words of this book that is found, for great wrath, for the great wrath of the Lord is kindled against us because we didn't do what the book said. He's understanding this. So then uh, Hokia goes to a priest, or uh, not a priest, a prophetess, or prophet, prophetess named Huldah, and Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tigdia, the son of Harkas, the keeper of the wardrobe. Now she dwelt in Jerusalem, the college, and they commune with her. And she told them what they needed to do and said, behold, uh, I, it says, thus saith the Lord, she's telling them, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon this place. So Israel's in trouble. Okay, so Israel's in trouble. And here's a good king trying to bring correction to Israel, tearing down altars that were built to worship false gods, and he's tearing them down everywhere. He's doing everything that he can to make it right. And he's opening up the book and trying to do everything he can to make it right. But God says, I'm going to bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read, because they have forsaken me. So they're trying to bring some correction here because they have forsaken the Lord. But then it says, but because thine heart was tender and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest that I spake against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, they should become a desolation and a curse, and has rent thy clothes and wept before me. So talking about what Josiah did. I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered unto thy grave in peace. He's telling him, because you did this, I'm going to gather you to your father's place, and you're going to go in peace, right? And thy eyes shall not see all the evil which I shall bring upon this place. And they brought the king the word again. So according to this, Josiah should have had a very peaceful exit out of this world because he was trying to do everything right. And maybe what he was doing could turn the wrath of God However, when we read further, it says, uh, <laughs> I'm just going to read some of this yellow just so I can keep going. It says, um, let's see here. And he read in their ears all the words of the book of the covenant, which was found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood by a pillar and made covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord, to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all of their heart and all their soul to perform the words of this covenant, which were written in this book. All the people stood, all the people stood to the covenant. It says, going on, to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made to Baal and Baal the false god and for the grove, and all the hosts of heaven, and he burned them with outside of Jerusalem in the fields of Kedron, and carried the ashes of them to Bethel. So he did all of that. He broke down the houses of the Sodomites, which were by the house of the Lord. He did all of that. And the altars that were on top of the upper chamber of Ahaz, which the king of Judah had made, and all the altars which Manasseh had made, and the two courts of the house, did the king beat down. He did all of that. So he's doing, he's doing great. He's, he's trying to move forward. He even got rid of all the workers of familiar spirits and wizards. He did all of that. But notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath. And he said, wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all of the provocations of Manasseh that provoked him with all. If you did all of that, and God's not going to turn away. He's not turning away. What, am I, what is God saying to, to us? We can keep praying, and we need to keep praying, but the sin 
of this nation and of this world have come up so high before the Lord. You read about this in the book of Revelation. It comes up so high. We all know that according to the book of Revelation, it's going to get bad, that, that the wrath of God is going to come. And it's like you, you, you cross a certain point and there is no turning back. But what God had planned for his people during the wrath is that they are not appointed to wrath. They are not supposed to receive it. He told Josiah, as a matter of fact, dude, I'm going to gather you in peace. So, so we're good. I'm still going to be bringing judgment. But for you, you're not going to see any of that evil. Okay? So Josiah should have held on to that word and been a little bit more discerning about the next thing that happened. Because... All right, this is what we'll do. We're going to go, going to, go to uh, Second Chronicles. Well, Manasseh did uh, terrible things in Jerusalem. And nevertheless, people sacrificed in high places. Chronicles parallels things that we read in kings so if you didn't know that now you know so here's josiah is talking about josiah we know all the things that he did we know that the word he found the bible and he tore his clothes told, told him what he needed to do and god said i'm still going to be bringing evil upon this place and then he says behold i will gather thee to thy fathers and thou shalt be gathered to thy grave in peace so again it's repeated this is what he was told but then something happened. And uh, let me see. Josiah was taking away these abominations. He was trying to do what was right. And here we read something that uh, I'm sad. Nevertheless, it says, Josiah found out. It says, and after this, Josiah was prepared had prepared the temple, Necho, king of Egypt, came up to fight against Karmash, Karmash of the Euphrates, and Josiah went out against them. Josiah should not have been doing that. He should not have been doing that. And here's what Necho, the king, told him. He says, uh, I come not against thee this day, but against the house wherewith I have war. Necho's telling Josiah this. For God commanded me to make haste, forbear, uh, forbear thee from meddling with God, who is with me, that he destroy thee not. So Nego saying, uh, Josiah, this is not between you and anybody else. This is between me and another king. Stay out of it. God has told me what to do. Josiah, good king, righteous king, doing everything he needs to do. He wouldn't listen. He got caught up in his own pride, and this is what happens next. He says, nevertheless, Josiah would not turn his face from him, but disguised himself that he might fight with him and hearken not unto the words of Nico from the mouth of God and came to fight in the valley of Megiddo, and the archer shot at King well, Josiah, and the king said to his servants, have me away, get me out of here. I am sore wounded. He should have never been in the fight. He was in the middle of a fight. He was supposed to go in peace, but he's in the middle of a fight. And then he gets shot. And then his servants therefore took him out of the chariot and put him into the second chariot that he had and brought him to Jerusalem and he died. What is God saying to me through that? Don't get caught up in your pride. And don't stop paying attention to me because it's going to be important. You might be in harm's way and you're not listening. Does everybody hear me? Yes. Yes, definitely. Oh, so yes. we have got to pay attention. Wow. We've got to pay attention. We, we've got to do that. So now 
I want you to see that uh, even though we are living in a very harsh reality right now, I want to read you some things about really where the world is and then where God wants to put us, what he's expecting of us, and then we'll conclude. So I'm just going to read through here. There's We're in crisis mode. The whole world is in crisis mode right now. So, yes. So I want to I want to read some things to you that I have gleaned from CNBC News, CNN, Fox Business, and maybe a couple other places. But I'm just going to read where we are, and I had this written down uh, last month. This is some of this is newer than last month, but the bulk of it comes from last month. So I'm just going to read here. You can follow me as I read if you like. But consumer prices rose 8.5% in March, slightly hotter than expected in the, in the highest since 1981. Prices are elevated. You all feel that. Core inflation is the hottest since August 1982. Surge inflation creates work wages falling behind inflation, which is at 8% in spite of wage raising 5.6% over the year. So if rate wages are only going up 5.6% and inflation is going up at 8%, you can't help but fall behind. But that's where we are right now. Food prices are up 8.8% from last year. Projected elevated costs for poultry, eggs, fats, uh, uh, put annoyance here, fruits and vegetables, non-alcoholic beverages, milk, sugar, sweets, cereal, bakery, meat. We are experiencing all those things going up, but something called shrinkflation. Uh, it was Vince that said that to me. I, even though I'm in finance, I had not heard that term. It's not widely used. But you can imagine what shrinkflation is. It means you're getting less what you're paying for for more money. You got to pay more money for less. That's shrinkflation. We're in it right now. The producer price index, the PPI, rose of 0.9% and doing so on a monthly basis of being, being elevated by 9%. And you say, well, what's normal? About 0.3 to 0.5%. That's the norm. As a matter of fact, in 2018, in the same month, it rose 1%. Now we're looking at 0.9%. Come on, man. It's, it's just rough. Uh, supply chain crisis, which has never existed before, relays all the way back up the, up the chain of authority to the president's decisions. They are telling us that our ports are working 24-7, and that's not true. Example. Long Beach has seven ports, but only one is functioning 24-7. Mm. This is what's happening everywhere. Okay? Supplier costs rose 11.2%, which is a little different from the uh, producer price index. Supplier price uh, rose 11.2%, the most since data has been recorded in uh, November 2010. From a year ago, uh, in March, the biggest the biggest gain, I should say gain, the biggest gain to a uh, on record. On record, yes. Biggest gain, I'm oh, still ahead. I'll get back to it. Okay. Uh, rising in March is the fastest pace since records have been kept at the Bureau of the Labor Statistics. It's going nuts, <laughs> the way things are going up. Rice, ground beef, and I kind of talked on this a bit. Rice, ground beef, citrus fruits, vegetables, all posted gains of more than 2% in March. Energy prices are up 11% and 32% respectively as gas prices top 18.3% for the month. 18.3% for the month. That, this was in uh, March. This was in March. Gains in clothing, <laughs> service excluding energy, 
and medical care, each of which increased 6.6% for the month. Transportation services also rose 2%, bringing its 12 month gain to 7.7%. 7.7%. Rising gas prices are forcing uh, Ubers and Lyft drivers off the road. This administration is, is blaming Russia and Pu 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 Putin, but it really is at the fault of the administration. All retirement systems are in jeopardy relative to this administration. Medical costs are rising. Brownouts and blackouts may come next. Loss of power. Uh, and regretfully, gas shortages and some essentials like baby food may become worse. This is coming, and it's all because of current administration policies. And we are still very much in debt, $30 trillion in debt, which increased $5 trillion since the beginning of this administration. In other words, it was a $25 trillion. Now it's at 30 and we can't pay back any of it. As inflation rises, the devaluation of the dollar is inevitable. Plus, we still have to pay the interest on this multi-trillion dollar debt. Administration unwittingly has abused the laws of economics, and the stress is about to be felt by the common American public and create a vulnerability that we have never seen. We'll be more vulnerable than we have ever been. Printing of money out of pure air is going to have disastrous conclusion. The bill back better uh, is another trillion dollars to get that going. Fueled by gun violence, cities across the U.S. are breaking all-time homicide records. Crime is going ridiculously up. What your, what's your administration doing? Chasing down parents in front of school boards. <laughs> Chasing down parents. Let me keep going. Uh, from a white industry, a white person, okay, industry insider, do we dare talk about the marketing toward Black on black crime, which is okay and acceptable, but date rape via music is not okay because it's insulting to white oligarchs because it is a real crime not to be sung about playfully. What I mean here is this, when you have all these black rappers rapping about all of their wickedness and how they're gonna hurt somebody, kill somebody, as well as all of the fornication that they speak about. That's fine. That's fine. Because the moguls see that that creates interest in the black community because they want to hear about that. So give it to them, which is self-destructive. But when a black artist sings about date rape, Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That, that, that's serious. That happens in the white community. You shouldn't be singing about that. That's serious. You can sing about black people killing black people. That's okay. But don't talk about date rape because that's serious. There's this tension that's going on. And, and I'm springing this up because we need the Lord bad. <laughs> black people need the Lord really, really bad. And there are so many mechanisms that are set up to aid in the self-destruction of people. So anyway, uh, and then to look at the, the stress that's going on in this nation, where we really need the Lord. Everyone, I'm sure, has heard about the shooting in Buffalo. It's, uh, it's horrible. But then Jesus said this, nation shall rise against nation, or ethnos against ethnos and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. And then he says, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. That's at Matthew chapter 24, I read you verses seven and verse 10. Internationally, Iran is getting more nukes and China is producing more nukes. That's what's going on globally. Across all social sectors and levels of the philosophical and politicization of citizens of U.S. culture. The administration is pushing 
the sexualization, gender confusion, transgenderism, C, uh, CRT, or uh, uh, critical race theory, and manipulating the system to keep parents out of the content and substance of the classrooms influencing their children. Executive orders are destroying women's sports. You guys have probably been seeing that. The former mayor of Moscow, leader's wife, investing millions in Biden's family, as well as China investing millions in the Biden family. And what do we have? What's going on here? I've talked about the rise in crime, the fentanyl um, disaster that is happening, taking out many of the young folks, the, the border crisis, uh, the lifting of, of uh, Title 42, which helps to police the borders. So here's here's a here's something of an observation. Did everybody keep up with that? I mean, I'm just trying to read through as quickly as I can. Okay. Uh, yes. All right. So you see the demonic takeover in every system of our education system, of our entertainment system, or our athletic system, political system, our moral systems. We are in this Isaiah 60, verse 2 period of behold, darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people. But the glory, but the Lord shall rise upon you, the glory of the Lord. The Lord shall rise upon you, and his glory shall be seen upon you. As the darkness is coming, the light is rising. And so one thing I wanted to point out is this persecution is happening against Christians globally. It's horrific. Just a couple of days ago, this young woman, a student on this campus, her name was Deborah Emmanuel Yabuku, uh, was stoned and burned for blasphemy against Allah's prophet Muhammad. And people watched. And this is in Nigeria, which happens to be one of the largest Christian nations in the world. Half of, New half of Nigeria is on fire and growing. And the other half is still given to Islam. And so this girl was, was making some comments and the, and the um, Islamic people that were there didn't like it. And they cornered her. She tried to retreat, tried to find, tried to find some shelter. And they pulled her out and stoned her and burned her. This is real. Just like Stephen. Yes, this, this is real. So what do I want us to understand? This is the state of the world that we're in. But we have been called to be agents in this time of the kingdom of God. And we're, we're to bring change. But we've got to understand that there can be no change without pain. There's got to be some pain associated with it. So here's what I know the Lord wants us to do. Here's what I can specifically tell you. I know what he wants me to do. And then if you all can see this, this is what you all should also do. It's time to fast. It's time to fast. And it's time for us to come back to some of the things that I had pointed out in 2016, 2017, about the altar in your homes. I've talked about it again here recently, but we've really got to lean on this. The scripture says in Isaiah chapter, chapter 57, 56, verse 7, it says, Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful, make them joyful in my house of prayer. Let's just go to it. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Let me tell you something, the more you pray, something happens and there's a joy that starts to take over and it's real. So he says, I make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be acceptable upon my art altar. Mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So there's this thing about his altar, this thing about making acceptable sacrifices. 
and, and, and being people given over to prayer because that is what he's wanted. And now this is what we need. And we need these houses of prayer. We need to be giving ourselves over to more prayer so we're not missing this next great wave that is coming that is going to be so great it will probably dwarf the day of Pentecost. That's how awesome it's going to be. So we need to be giving ourselves over to fasting. So Isaiah 56 gives way to Isaiah 58 about the kind of fast that we should be doing. And I'm going to say that this fast, I'm going to say it's going to start 10 days before Pentecost. We, we're we looking at Pentecost coming up the 5th of June, the 5th of June. So from the 26th till the 5th, I'm going to be fasting. And, and you all, I would encourage you to join me in this fast and to pray a certain kind of way and to spend a certain amount of time with God at the very least. At least what I put here, 10 days and a tenth of each day prioritized for him. That means two and a half hours. Somehow you prioritize that time and you spend it with the Lord. And I'm going to tell you that during that 10-day period, I'm going to be spending more than two hours a day with the Lord, maybe four, maybe even six. <laughs> but I, I, this is something I know I have to do. And I and, and, and this is the way that I believe that we have to pray. That what did the Lord instruct us to do? He told us to watch and pray. Watch and pray. So I'm going to tell you, come back to the things that I told you to be looking at Pray this kind of prayer that the people of God would recognize that the Lord is the vine, the Father is the husband man, and we need to be branches that are in him that are bearing fruit because every branch in him that bear not fruit, he's going to take it away. So we need to be praying, God, help me to bear fruit. Purge me to bear fruit. Because if we will do this, then we open up the right to ask the Lord for whatever we want, whatever we need. So I would encourage you to go back and read through the first 17 verses of John chapter 15 and understand that when we do this and we really put his word in us, he says what he's looking for us to do is to bear fruit. He says, you have not chosen me. That's huge. But I have chosen you and ordained you that, that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit would, should remain, that whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. I'm telling you to do all these things so that when you're asking me for things, I will do it. If you're not going to do what I'm telling you to do, why should I do what you're asking? That's where this is really at. So I would encourage all of you, go back and study John 15, especially those first 15 verses, and then pray it. Find, ask the Lord, teach me how to pray that. Teach me how to pray this thing in 1 Peter or 2 Peter, that according as he has given his divine power unto us, uh, unto all things, that pertain to life and godliness, that the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding and great promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, these things that, I'm not going to read them all right now, I'm just going to go to this last part, where it says that if, it says that, um, if you do these things, you shall never fall. If you will do these things, you will never fall. And an entrance, the entrance into the presence of God. Not just talking about dying and going to heaven. He's talking about opening up like a reality of the spirit. And you might even see the Lord walk into your room. It could be like that. An entrance is opened up because you're doing things that help build you to be 
a, a receiver of all the benefits that he's given. He's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. As I said, there is so much here, and I don't have time to really talk about it all. But these are the things that we should be praying. First Thessalonians, he told us what, how we were supposed to be looking at these last days, that uh, the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. And he says, upon them, tra travail is going to come upon them. But you, brother, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are the children of light and children of the day and are not of the night, because we are not appointed to wrath. We are not appointed to wrath. So understand that. Looking at Colossians, go back and look at what we have here in Colossians and read it and pray it. I'm going to tell you three things. Pray John 15, pray 2 Peter 3, pray Colossians. Those things, learn how to pray. And then our, our priorities of baptism, I've got these two things here about when these people heard about baptism, they didn't wait a month or three months. They got baptized immediately. Acts chapter 16, verse 20 talks about the jailer. Immediately was baptized. Acts 22, Paul, when he had his conversion experience, immediately baptized. What I'm saying is there are different things that we need to be looking at that we might need to change how we approach their priority uh, because there's a drift that's happening in the body of Christ. We're moving away from things that God has called us to. And we of this body cannot afford to drift and be like anyone else that we're just looking at because we're saying, well, they don't take things that seriously. Maybe we shouldn't take things as seriously. Forget that. We're in a time where we need to be taking very serious measures to connect ourselves with the Lord. So again, there's the fast for 10 days. It begins on the 26th. Fast any way you want, just as long as it's fast. You can do absolute fast for, for, for 10 days, starting with three days of no water, and then after that, only water, all the way up to cut one meal out a day, or just do juices, or just do something. Just make sure you are sacrificing something consistently for 10 days, and you are dedicating two and a half hours to the Lord, prioritized. And then <clears throat> there's this. Um, understanding that when we're looking at the book of Revelation, I want to read two things here. It says, things that must shortly come to pass. The book of Revelation is not about things that happened in the past. And I'm trying to help everybody here. It's not about things that happened in the past. It's about things that are going to happen. So Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1. It says, after this, I looked up and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking to me, which said, come up hither, I must show thee things which must be hereafter. Never the past. That's not what the book of Revelation is about. It's about the future. So I need us, as we're going into different things and we're studying, remember, you're not reading about the past. You're reading about stuff that's coming down the road. Although everything that you read in the book of Revelation has its fulfillment or has its type or has its shadow in the things of the past. And those things that are written in the past were written for our learning to know how we are to move forward in the future. Now, I'm just going to read a couple more things, and then we're going to conclude. Uh, these are future prophetic projections. So there's an elevation of activity among the angels coming to see us. Dreams and the importance of dreams is being elevated. Um, there was a prophet that had a dream. Just to show you how powerful this would be, I've got a note here. A prophet dreamed a dream that somebody else dreamed and he talked about it in a meeting, and he never met this person before, and he started to talk about the dream that she had, and then pointed to her and said, you had this dream, and she said, yes, I did, and the dream was about 
changes that are coming into our government and that God is going to be exposing everything. It's coming. So dreams are important. And as messengers, we have to take our responsibility as, as messengers of the word of God, as stewards of the word of God seriously. So I'm not going to harp on that much more, but I am going to tell you that the time of the Gentiles is almost up. The reason why the world, why is it we, why is the, why is it the world uh, forget how to word it. The world complains. The world complains about itself. Why is the world so messed up? It's because God had given the world to man. Man gave it to Satan, and now God is saying, "All right, well, I'm just going to give it to you for about six days and see what you can do with it." So it's messed up because of what we've done and what the devil has done. But we're coming into the seventh day. We're coming into the return of the Lord. We're coming into a new government where it's going to be different. And the precursor to that is you all. And so um, I want to read some prophetic things, and then I'm going to end. Uh, a prophet named Terry Bennett in 2001 had a visitation from Gabriel. And that sounds crazy, but uh, evidently it must have happened. Lots of confirmation. Gabriel the angel made it clear to him concerning four nations. He said, in 2001, I want you to watch four nations. They are signposts for what is going to happen. The four nations are Greece, Italy, Spain, and France. Greece is going to want another Alexander the Great. Italy is going to want another emperor. Spain is going to want a king and a queen. France is going to want another Napoleon. And Satan is going to offer that to them in one person. Guess who that is? The Antichrist. Note, I got a note here. Chris Reed of Morningstar, who's taking over for Rick Joyner, of which I know Rick Joyner, spent time with Rick Joyner, been down in Moravian Falls with Rick Joyner and Bobby Connor and, and those guys. And so Chris has earned the trust of Rick to take over that ministry. And Chris is a prophet in his own right. So Chris had some things shared uh, with him by an angel five days ago or four days ago. And one of the things that the angel told him was exactly what Tony Bennett heard in 2001. These very same things. But let me share with you a little more of what Chris had, and then we'll conclude. As I said, Chris Reed of Morningstar Ministries, he's um, leading the ministry there and over the School of the Prophets, and he said these things. First, an angel comes into his room and tells him, I'm going to share some things with you that I want you to share with the body of Christ, and there's other things that are personal that I don't want you to share. So there are some personal things he didn't share, but the things that he said he could share, he shared. So Biden and Putin will soon be out before they finish their terms. We'll see. They're pretty accurate about a lot of things. And so Biden and Putin will soon be out before they finish their terms. Number two, Kamala Harris will uncomfortably sit in the POTUS office, but she's not going to like it because she's going to find out she is absolutely under-equipped. And so she's going to be leaning on Elizabeth Warren. Yes, that ultra liberal. Oh man, it's really crazy. But anyway, this is what the angel told. Him. So those, that's number number two. Number three, we're going to continue in a crisis climate with significant devaluation of currency, which began in March. And what he saw was a fifty-dollar bill being cut in half, and he said, "This is the way your economy is going to go." The $50 bill was the image being cut in half of its value. Then that, that half value is going to be cut again. And then that value is going to be cut again. He said it's going to be very rough for some people. But this is the time where they're going to have to walk very closely with God. So that was 
the vision about the currency. Number four, every nation wants higher visibility and power. France, Spain, Italy, and Greece, as I had said before. And the very words that were said to the other prophet, uh, to Terry, those words that were said to Terry were the exact same words that the angel said to Chris Reed. And it also added, keep your eye, number five, keep your eye on Emmanuel Macron. He said he is being groomed for something. And, and his power is going to become greater and greater because France is going to want more and more recognition and power itself. And, he, and the angel said, keep your eye on him. And he said, he's not saying he's going to be the Antichrist. He said, but the angel told him, I want you to look at his birthday. So I took a note and I said, let me find out about this birthday. His birthday is 12-21-77. Anybody know what happens on the 21st of December every year? I'll tell you. It's the beginning of the winter solace. It's the birthday of Horus. It's the birthday of the sun god. It's the birthday of, of, of a number of different false gods. Just something to think about. Number six, there will be energy shifts in the earth which will create greater climate change and trigger earthquakes. And there's going to be one earthquake. I don't think I wrote it here. Did I? I don't think I wrote it here. That there's going to be one earthquake that's going to happen in India. And when it does, India is going to find itself in the middle of a very intense war. Well, I didn't write that, but I remember that. Number seven, China is going to become more aggressive towards Taiwan and will not stop there. Number eight, the angel says to Chris, now, make sure you say this, that the prayers of God's people are not in vain. Make sure you tell them that. And the last thing is that there are confirmations of prayer being prioritized to ride the wave coming in June and in November because it looks like there's going to be something happening next month with a move of the Holy Ghost. And you need to have been preparing yourself in the word and in prayer. So the 26th of this month, we want to head into this time of the Feast of Tabernacles on a fast. We'll start the fast on a Thursday. We'll end it on a Saturday night, coming into Pentecost Sunday, the 1st of June. And I'll tell you one other thing I knew. One of the reasons why there's going to be this move is because a couple of years ago, and I don't remember how I knew it, but I knew it. Maybe it was a prophet. But I heard that Roe versus Wade, I just kind of knew it was impossible for Roe versus Wade to even be coming up for discussion. But I heard that it was going to be overturned about a year, two years ago. It would be overturned. Here we are looking at it being overturned, and when it happens, it's going to trigger something positive in the United States. And for us, brothers, after all these things that I've said, pray this. Pray that the Lord of the harvest, verse 2, pray that the Lord of the harvest would send forth laborers into his harvest, that we would be about the harvest now. We'd be about prayer. We'd be about harvest. We'd be about setting up the altar in our homes, praying for our family, our family members, praying for our friends, praying for the people that are unfamiliar to us. And that's it. I'll try to get through this as quickly as I could, but I pray that this was um, coherent enough for you to follow. About 11 minutes after 8, if there are any questions, anything anybody wants to say before we conclude, I, this has just been a time for me to download. I just want to download all of this into you. 
these are things we can always come back to, but very important things I wanted to let you know now. So, thoughts? I thought you had a date set that you was gonna bring up tonight about it's time for us to go out into the buoy area and be effective. Because like you said, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. So what few we have, we need to send out into the buoy area. And I think it's time for us to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it would seem that it would have to happen when everybody is available to do that, either on an evening or a Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon. Um, but maybe I should just let uh, you guys kind of figure that out. I've done this alone. I will do it with folks. I know that there's other plans that I have to go into the shopping area, right down there where Honey Bake Ham is and where the, um, right, right where there Honey Bake Ham, they told me I could stand outside and, and preach. So I'm thinking to do that. I have the energy, I have the, the fire to do that right now, but uh, <laughs> oh, this, this is what I'm thinking about. So, but yes, Jesse, let's 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 make some solid decisions on that. And everybody wants to be a part of that, we can do that. Amen. Um, amen. Uh, Pastor, one thing that uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny you say that uh, about fasting. Uh, I was talking to Kimberly, and God put a beautiful thought. This, you two are one. And uh, and then I kept on saying, yeah, Lord, I know this, but uh, uh, I could not figure out because I was thinking about fasting for 24 hours. And sometimes with me, I'm just too small for it. And I get weak very quick when I do that. But God says, you fast 12 hours, Kimberly fast 12 hours. It's just like one flesh doing it. What do you think about that? All right, uh, look. The, the, the whole point of the fast is to deny your flesh and build your spirit. That's what the fast is all about. And I know that the Lord will honor that. And the key thing is you're consistent at it. Just if we're going to say 10 days, then it's 10 days. And, and, and I don't care. Again, let me be super clear. I don't care. What kind of fast it is? Just fast and and dedicate a couple of hours, two hours and a half to God. Uh, just do it. Prioritize it, you know, because He's worth it. He's worth the whole day. Yes, <laughs> the whole day. Yes, every day. So definitely. But I'm I'm hoping we can connect with something that God is doing. That's why I'm encouraging this and being aware. That the, the sharper that we are in the spirit and the deeper we are in the word, the more we can understand why the Lord told us, watch and pray. It's funny, he didn't tell us, go out and grab a bunch of food and store it and do all these things. He didn't say anything like that. Not that I'm going to be criticizing people that do it, but the one thing he told us to do was the thing that we absolutely must do. And I believe that as we do it, we open up realms of the supernatural to take care of things like food and protection and things like that. So. Okay. And, uh, now, but you were saying a 10 day fast, but you're saying you're starting the 26th? 26th. To June, to June 1st? June 5th. Or oh, June 5th. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. Now. Glad you asked. Yes. Yeah. All right. We're fasting up until um, Shavuot or Pentecost, and and I and I want you guys to pray those scriptures. You pray, you know, you can pray anything else you want, but you gotta pray these scriptures along with everything else. If you're just winging it, wing it, but you're gonna have to come back to these scriptures. You're gonna, and and I'm not even saying you have to pray them all three. All the time, every, but you have to, you just have to do it. You have to engage in this to see what I'm talking about. Some things can be taught and other things just have to be caught. And this is one of those, you got to catch 
what I'm saying. You gotta get in the process to understand what I'm saying. And then if you find yourself just being so hung up, not hung up in a negative way, but in a good way, on one of these passages, and that you couldn't get to the other ones, that's fine. That's great. Get to the other one the next time. And then the next one, the time after that. Just make sure you've incorporated it during this time. It's gonna help. The kinds of things that we're praying for in that is gonna help everybody. So, other questions, other thoughts, other observations. Yeah, you were talking about the increase in all, all of the different areas, the departments where the increase is, is, is soaring. It's going to actually affect us also in the next three months where we're going to be, we're going to pretty much have discussions in church about it because it's going to be so serious. So this is just something for us to think about and start preparing for. Yeah. Well, the preparing started right here with this. Jesus Amen. said, watch and pray. Men Amen. should always pray. This is what we have to do. This is what, exactly. this is not, this isn't suggestions from, from the Lord. This isn't telling us what we got to do. Amen. There's a reason why when I wrote that in the in the text message, the thing I said about instruction, I won't I won't I won't bring it up here other than to say there was a reason why I said instruction. And we need to be able to take instruction and execute instruction. It's very much given to just doing whatever we want. And the Lord is going to begin to check us on it. <coughs> All right, folks. Uh, anything else about 818? And I'm still up here at the church, so I'm going to get ready to go. Unless there's anything else that somebody else wants to say? Or, or, well, yeah, anything else anybody else wants to say? Just uh, Revelation 6. I think you, you're, you're putting it down where it says a day's worth of wages for a loaf of bread. I think we're headed to those days very, very quickly. Yeah. Agree. It's unfortunate that, the, you know, I mean, here we are a family of three and we used to last year, we're doing a hundred dollars in groceries. Now that hundred dollars, now we're looking at two, $250 a week for the same things that we used to buy. Really? It's, it, it, it's starting to really show, starting to really show. Stop. Yep. When I said I'm in a different, I'm in a place that I've never been before. I've never felt the press of the Lord to be demanding like I am now, because now it's like if you don't, you could be like Josiah. You know, just kind of like, well, I'm righteous, I just do what I want to do. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. It could cost you. Yeah, very, very just make sure you share a word, Pastor, when the Lord tells you, okay, it's time to prepare in a certain way. Make sure you share it, please. Because <laughs> I know he's just gonna definitely be listening out for it. Exactly. Uh, this is why I'm spending as much time as I as I am in yes. God. Because there's some things people feel like they can say, they haven't been spending no time with God, they're not in the word, they're not loving people they're not even qualified to talk now just that's pretty bold for me to even say that but we're just in that time where all of the all of the lightness and all of the the uh, lack of paying attention to what the lord has been saying for years all of that's going to have to stop now and people you're going to listen to the people that have spent the time and paid the cost and paid the price and other people that just want to come along because they got something to say. Nah. Nah. Forget that. Mm. That's why I'm spending yeah. time. Because I don't want to take things for granted. I need to really have been spending some time and knowing what I'm talking about. So keep praying for me, brothers, as I pray for you. Amen. 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 And then something that, that I was hoping you had put on your notes are also, Pastor, I don't know if you heard it, but last, I think it was last week, last Thursday, they had a poll 
uh, that, that uh, somebody, uh, I can't remember where it was, in Kansas or something, they did a poll on a bunch of churches. 67% of the churches that they polled, the pastors, youth pastors, uh, teachers, and uh, everybody in the churches, to ask them how much the world is influencing the churches and compared to the church influencing the world, 67% of the pastors in every one of these churches they polled, they said they had cut down on how they preached so they wouldn't offend. <laughs> that <laughs> is getting sad. 67%. I was, expecting I was like, are you kidding me? I thought, I thought they were kidding, but no, they were serious. They said, no, they did not preach. And, 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 then, and then sadly, because the people that they were polling, a, 90, a, a good percentage of them are not Holy Spirit filled. They don't believe in baptism of the Holy Spirit. And if they don't have the Holy Spirit leading them, what are they going to do? They just want to be, be able to bring people in. So they try not to offend. They're starting to allow more and more of the world influence the church instead of being the, the church influencing the world. This is, why, is why, Lewis, this is why I'm saying pray those prayers that the apostles pray. Pray those prayers that, that prayer in Colossians chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. Uh, there, we have to be praying for the church. We need to be praying for the leadership. We have to be praying for each other. We need to be praying with the mind of Christ. And uh, hey, what I'm going to say this, brothers, I'm about talked out. I've been up here all day, so I'm about to jump off <laughs> and get home, kiss my wife, eat something. But please take these things to heart. This, is, this has been reported. We'll make it available. And I love you all. I pray for us to be super strong in the Lord and in the power of this mic. And on that note, I'm going to say good night. God bless you all. And uh, look for you Sunday. Amen. Amen.